Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 17th episode of the Atlas Society Asks. My name is Jennifer Grossman. I'm CEO of the Atlas Society. Um, I am very proud to have as our guest today, Andy Puzder, dear friend and longtime supporter of the Atlas Society. Uh, before I even get into introducing Andy, I want to remind you guys of the drill. We want to get to as many of your questions as possible. Please keep them short. You can type them in to the Q&A uh, button and on Zoom or just uh, go ahead and um, type them into the comment stream on Facebook. So uh, in addition to being a sponsor at this year's Atlas Society Gala and uh, our keynote speaker at our very first Atlas Society Gala four years ago, Andy uh, Custer has had a storied career as CEO of CKE Restaurants, which include Carl's Jr. and Hardee's. He is the author of several books, including this one, the Capitalist Comeback, um, and, uh, and also one of his first books uh, on job creation. Speaking of books, however, um, one of the things that I loved to learn about Andy is that um, he is a huge Ayn Rand fan, and he had uh, all of his six children read The Fountainhead before they were allowed to get their driver's permit, a story that I memorialized in my Wall Street Journal um, op-ed on Can You Love God and Ayn Rand. So uh, welcome again, Andy. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, great to be here, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. So, you know, you and I have chatted about how the, the media just incessantly uh, feeds the public stories of doom and gloom, um, panic and fear. And you had a really uh, interesting piece in, in The Federalist uh, yesterday, I believe, in which you said they're missing the whole entire story, the real story of what's been happening over the past few months. You wanna share the good news with us? Sure, if you, um, if you know, in August we, the Bureau of Labor Statistics announced the, uh, the employment numbers, the labor numbers, and we actually had the fourth best month of job creation in the history of the, of, of the government keeping records going back to 1939. Uh, the only reason it was fourth best was because June was best, May was second best, and July was third best. Uh, with respect to people getting jobs, people becoming employed, August was the third best month, uh, just behind uh, June and May. So really tremendous, tremendous jobs numbers. This is really the most dynamic economic recovery in the history of the United States. We've never seen anything like it over the past four months. Uh, an incredible comeback. Uh, so it, it, even if you just look, in July, the unemployment rate was 10.2%. In August, it went to 8.4%. After the Great Recession, unemployment peaked at 10% in October of 2009. It took Obama 27 months to get unemployment from 10% to under 8.5%. It took Donald Trump in this economy one month. So we're seeing amazing, amazing economic uh, numbers being posted. And what do you read about in the press? Well, the very day the numbers come out, almost anticipating that th what, what they would say when they did come out, The Atlantic came out with this horrible false story of Donald Trump uh, uh, speaking in a derogatory way about American soldiers who had died uh, in a war overseas. It just, it just wasn't true. It was false. Anybody that knows Donald Trump would know that that was false. Fourteen people who were present immediately came forward and said that the story was untrue. Uh, but that dominated the, uh, the major media outlets for a number of days. Then we had this incredible um, uh, peace reached in the Middle East, with, first with the UAE, then Bahrain, uh, we've got Saudi Arabia allowing Israeli jets to fly over over their land. That never happened before. Uh, Serbia and Kosovo come to um, an economic agreement, basically a peace agreement. They both uh, recognize Israel, move the capital to Jerusalem. Tremendous news. Peace in the Middle East. Can you imagine? And, of course, the New York Times comes out with a story about uh, Trump is weak and inconsistent on China, and Joe Biden is somehow a born-again, you know, China foe, which really kind of flies in the face of the fact that China, as our intelligence service recently revealed, wants to 
uh, see Biden get elected. Of course they do, because Trump is being tough on him. And then they come out to further cover this incredible economic and foreign policy news. You get this ridiculous story from Bob Woodward claiming that uh, President Trump was trying to prevent a panic, uh, which he admitted he was uh, on national television to a CNN reporter back in March, uh, and by distorting the medical evidence, and uh, which Dr. Fauci, of course, immediately came out and said that didn't happen. Not only did Woodward misquote him in the book, but President Trump always had come forward with the relevant and important medical information. So we're really seeing the press uh, do everything they can to get a socialist government into power and to make sure that Donald Trump, who is an existential threat to socialism and this collectivist ideology uh, doesn't get reelected. So hopefully everybody on this uh, on this program will go out and vote for Donald Trump and get all their family to vote for him now. So and everybody on this program get your questions ready um, and, and just type them in because this is an enormous um, privilege and opportunity to have Andy Puster uh, with us here today. And I know a lot of you also got the opportunity to meet him um, four years ago when he stepped forward really appreciated that to to be the uh speaker at our first gala the only challenge andy was that you really set the bar pretty high and so i've had to scramble well, to, to, <laughs> to get um you know speakers that would be able to follow in your footsteps and and we we have we succeeded last year with chip wilson and this year with peter diamandis and one of the things that Diamandis talks about, which I think is so interesting, is how the pandemic and lockdowns have uh, accelerated a lot of changes that were already um, taking place in the economy, such as you know automation. So um, particularly given your experience, uh, not just in running um, fast food conglomerates, but also you know you've had you came. You're a self-made person. You worked all kinds of jobs to put yourself through college and law school, um, construction and managing a guitar store and painting. So, so what's your view on how the experience of the past few months um, has changed, let's say, the, the restaurant industry, perhaps in a way that's even positive? I think, you know, I think it changed really all of us. I, uh, my favorite example is my 98-year-old mother who uh, lives in a nursing home in Nashville. And uh, if you had mentioned Amazon to her in February, she would have thought you were talking about a river in Brazil. You know, now she's the queen of Amazon. You know, the boxes pile up at the, at the nursing home with all of the things she orders. We, uh, you know, my wife Dee and I, we've gotten very used to eating our, from our favorite restaurants, having the food brought to the front door, dropped off. Uh, sitting down and watching a first-run movie uh, or a first-run TV show on, on in our living room or our family room uh, and enjoying the meal. It's just the way the way people purchase products is changing. Uh, and the, the businesses that can adjust to the way people purchase will be very successful. You know, Amazon, of course, will be very successful. We've got, you know, Jeff Bezos, well, I don't agree with uh, with him on a number of issues. I have to say, this man created uh, the greatest distribution system in the history of the world. There's never been a country, uh, an individual, a company that's come even close to this. Maybe the only comparable thing I can think of is Sears Roebuck back at the turn of the century with the Sears catalog, which, which brought goods to all parts of the country and you could have them shipped. You didn't have to go to a store anymore. This is, this is comparable to that, but, but so much greater. But all of these delivery services make a huge, huge difference. You know, I will tell you that my uh, former sector, the quick service restaurant sector, is actually doing very well. And the reason it's doing well, it's even doing better. Many brands are doing better than they did last year before the pandemic. And that's because in the quick service sector, you have drive throughs and people are using the drive through. And if you also have delivery, for example, like Domino's or Pizza Hut, if you're known for delivery, you know, that, that's, a, that's a real bonus. So you can have third-party delivery, you can have in-house delivery, and then you've got these drive-through restaurants where you can, you can, you know, go and not really communicate with anybody and take a meal home to, to your kids if you're a soccer mom, or I guess the kids aren't playing soccer anymore, but people still have to eat. 
Um, it, 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 it's, a, it's really making a huge difference in how we purchase products. And that goes, that's across the board. That's everybody in every sector. Yeah, I, you know what I would love to see as a next sort of generation change in the uh, restaurant business um, is to find, because as you mentioned earlier, uh, they, they can be downplaying it, but there is a lot of good um, economic news, a lot of growth. Uh, it's been completely disrupted and, and jumbled um, in different, you know, industries getting hit and other industries flourishing. But, um, but there is a lot of, of wealth. And um, I think people particularly who like that dining experience um, and are willing to pay for a fine dining experience uh, to be able to find a way to innovate and bring that dining experience into your home, you know, that you would have people come, they would bring all the silverware and all the settings and the food and, and cook for you in your home. So I've, I'm, I'm still waiting for that because I'm not very good at, uh, at eating. So, um, so you had, uh, I, I alluded earlier to your admiration of the literature of Ayn Rand, and I hadn't even known that about you because we knew each other through the food industry. Uh, we knew each other through politics. So when I came up to visit you, when you were still living in Santa Barbara, and I'm like, okay, I'm running the Atlas Society now. And you're like, well, let me tell you this. Uh, you know, I've read everything that Ayn Rand has ever written. And I was like, oh. I was kind of shocked because I also knew that you were very religious. And um, so I, I guess, you know, I just had this prejudice or um, in preconceived idea that like you would not be um, so into her philosophy and her literature. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about you know what you what you read and how you felt after you said you know you let, read the last uh, scrap of of her writing that you could find, and also how did your kids? I want to say how did they react as kids to your requirement? and uh, how maybe have you seen it influence them in their adult lives? Sure, yeah, I, I, uh, I actually picked up Fountainhead um, just as a book to read when I was my sophomore year of college. It was, uh, actually it was at Kent State University. It was a tumultuous time that was 19, it was 1969 and 70, uh, the year of the shooting. So it was an interesting time in that, uh, that and, and a lot of leftist influence in the school. Uh, and uh, I read Fountainhead, and I thought, oh, my God, these are my people. I, I finally found my people. I uh, went on and immediately read Atlas Shrugged. I think I probably would have done a whole lot better that year in school if it hadn't been for Anne Rand, because I think I spent too much time reading her books. Then I read Anthem. I read, I read virtually anything I could find. Uh, and I was so disappointed when it was done. I couldn't believe there was no more. There, there weren't any more novels. There wasn't any more exposition of her thinking. Uh, and it, it was um, it, it was very disappointing, but it it really influenced me. It it influenced me in a uh, a very positive way. I think Fountainhead probably had the greatest influence because when you read Fountainhead, it, it, what it really says is that the whole world can think you're wrong. The whole world thought Howard Wark was wrong, and you can still be right. It doesn't matter that the world thinks you're wrong. You can still be right. And I, when my kids, I've got six kids. Uh, and as they got through high school, when they got to the point where they, uh, they, it was time to get their driver's license, I told them the only way that I would uh, allow them to get a driver's license uh, or purchase insurance for them was if they read Fountainhead. And e each of them read Fountainhead, and uh, they were all uh, not excited about it at the beginning, but by the time they read it, they, they really were very excited about it. By the way, I had them read Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis as well, but I think, I, I, you know, Fountainhead had a real influence on him. And I think when you, when you know that the whole world could be wrong and you still could be right, then when everybody says, you know, oh, we should vote for Barack Obama, he's like the cool candidate. Well, you, you might say, why? Or when people say, you know, we should do drugs. Let's all, let's all, we'll go out and drink. Everybody's doing it. Well, well, maybe you'd say, well, why is everybody doing it? You know, because you value yourself. You value your own opinion. And I, my most interesting story of my kids reading the book was my son, Matthew, who's now 28 and worked at Ford uh, in their M&A department. And uh, he, he was upstairs reading it. And he, I remember I was sitting on the couch uh, watching TV. And my wife was in a chair near me. 
And he comes down with his finger in a book and he says, I just read Howard Rourke's speech to the jury. Why haven't I heard about this before? Why don't I learn this in school? Where did this come from? And he was, he was you know, very emotional about it. And I looked at my wife and said, uh, I don't think we're going to have to worry about this one. I think he's going to be just fine. <laughs> so, he, uh, uh, he, and he went on and, and it turns out he was just fine. Uh, but I think it influenced all my kids. My kids, you know, my oldest son is a, one of our nation's nuclear physicists up at Lawrence Livermore Labs. My second son's a lawyer, graduated from Pepperdine and runs a CEO of a tech startup now. My daughter was a fashion designer in New York. Matt works at Ford. Um, my one son was majoring in architecture, just dropped out of college, and we'll see what he picks it up again. And then my youngest son, John, just graduated from college and wants to go to law school. So I think it's had a positive effect on, uh, on all of them. And uh, you know, I'm very proud of the lessons they got from it and what they've done with their lives. Well, if any of your kids, particularly those uh, or grandkids that are um, of a reading age, uh, in addition to providing them with copies of our Anthem graphic novel, we do have a wonderful book club. Uh, and maybe we should have one of these books um, as a subject uh, pretty soon. A good idea. A, yeah, get a, a star appearance from, from Andy. So well, I'll tell you, there's a, a lot of history in that book that kids uh, aren't getting in high school or college now. Uh, and it, it, I wrote it to be very readable. And one, of the, one comment that I get consistently from people who've read the book is, they should make this mandatory reading in every high school. Uh, and it's, that because there there's a lot in there that you're, you're just not going to get these days. Uh, and your kids and your grandkids aren't going to get it. So I, well, I encourage everybody to read it. It's an adult book. I think uh, if you can get, get it in the hands of your kids and grandkids, I think it'd be a benefit for them. Well noted. So we will work to, to make that happen um, with our book club. Uh, we've got just hundreds of kids uh, signed up from actually all over the world. So, it, you know, and I think oh, great. quite a nice little treat for, um, for them to be able to maybe even hear from you. So, um, so I, again, and people ask your questions. You, we've got Andy Puzder here and, uh, you know, he, he can talk about an experience when, you know, you had all of the world standing against you. Uh, you I, I think it's very telling when we see, um, the uh, the nominees uh, in in the case of Andy he was nominated to be Secretary of Labor and our good friend um, Steve Moore you know who's been on this show too uh, how the, just the hatred the lies the vitriol that you um, and the threats I mean the death threats that uh, people mailing white powder you know to yeah. to your home. to my wife which is really terrific yeah so. Um, but I, I think that, you know, when you experience something like that, it, it can be, you know, it's, it's helpful to have had your spirit inoculated by reading Ayn Rand early and just say, you know what, I've seen this before. This, is, this has happened. Um, so, yeah. So recently I was interviewed by CBS um, for a documentary that they are doing on um, socialism. And you had very generously, Andy, offered to to speak to them as well, but with the lockdowns um, and the restrictions on travel, we weren't able to, to make that happen. But um, I know that they had one question, which maybe I'll just you know ask you, that they were hoping to ask you. And uh, it was on socialism, socialist style policies, redistributionist style policies, uh, and, and their actual business, their actual impact on business from the perspective of someone who has um, been on the front lines of that. What are, what are some of the, the ways that uh, socialist policies have impacted your, the businesses you've either worked for or that you've, that you've run? Well, let me give you, let me give you a, a quick kind of example. I'll use the minimum wage because it, um, it was such an impactful thing in the restaurant industry. But let, let me start with what we're trying to accomplish with the minimum wage, what the socialists claim is that if the government mandates that you pay people a certain amount, people will make more money. I mean, that's the idea, right? We'll take money from these greedy companies and we'll give it to people. It, absolutely, just the opposite is true. President Trump just proved that. President Trump, following the horrific stagnation of the Obama era, 
we found President Trump took over economy with very limited job opportunities. There were 1.9 million more people unemployed than job openings uh, when he left office in January 2017. There hadn't been a month of 3% wage growth since the end of the recession. And people had been dropping out of the labor force, discouraged. They couldn't find jobs. They couldn't find good paying jobs. They dropped out of the labor force throughout his administration. Donald Trump comes in, uh, reverses virtually every policy that, that Obama had in place. He deregulates the economy. He slashes taxes. He focuses on domestic energy. And by March of 2018, so a little over a year after he takes office, for the first time ever since the, since the government began recording the data, uh, the number of job openings exceeded the number of people unemployed. It stayed that way for 24 months in a row until the uh, pandemic. And for 17 of those months, there were actually a million more job openings than people unemployed. Because there were so many job openings and so much competition for employees, we had a worker shortage. Mm -hmm. Nobody could find blue collar workers. You can remember if you tried to get anything done on your house, it was like impossible. Blue collar workers became more valuable than white collar workers. And beginning in August of 2018, we had 20 straight months of 3% plus wage growth and better wage growth for workers than for managers. With all that, the, the labor participation rate increased. People were no longer discouraged. They, uh, they saw there were jobs available. They saw they were good paying jobs and they came back into the economy. The result was last year, and the Census Bureau just released this data, median family income went to an historic high of $68,000 a year. It was up over 6% from 2018, which is a bigger increase than, than the entire Obama administration increase. And poverty hit its, its historic low going back to 1959 when they started recording the data. So what we've done is we created competition for employees. That drove wages. It drove growth. It, drew, it drove the economy. All good things. Everything happened. Now, what happens if you increase the minimum wage? Well, there was a report last July uh, by the Congressional Budget Office, which is a, um, a, you know, a, a nonpartisan part of the government. I personally think they lean left, but we're going to just call them nonpartisan for purposes of this. They reported on the $15 minimum wage. They said that 1.3 million people would lose their jobs. But more importantly, they said by, by the year that it was implemented, by the year you got to $15, uh, family income would decrease by $8.7 billion because of lost jobs, increased consumer prices, and a lack of growth by businesses. Businesses don't grow when they have to mandatorily spend money on labor. They grow when the economy's growing and money's coming in. So what we've seen is the tremendous free market capitalist policies of President Trump driving this spectacular growth that clearly benefited everybody, no matter your race, your, your, your sex, it didn't matter, versus what the Bernie Sanders and uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you know, they're kind of driving Joe Biden right now. Uh, if you look at what they're trying to implement, the impact is people lose their jobs and family income actually declines. Why would you implement a policy that caused family income to decline by $8.7 billion? It just doesn't make any sense. This is what socialism does. This is why New York City in, uh, in Atlas Shrugged is starting to look like New York City today because you've got a socialist running the city. Uh, he, he's demeaning the police. He won't let businesses open. They're overregulated. They're overtaxed. And you're coming close to an Atlas Shrug type situation in New York uh, because of policies like a mandatory minimum wage. Right. And of course, that's kind of a long answer. <laughs> no, it's, that's great. And it's not just uh, businessmen and creators and inventors who shrug. It's our law enforcement who shrug and decide oh, yeah. that, you know, I'm not, I'm, this is crazy. I'm not going to sac sacrifice myself, you know, I mean, to in a, a situation that's unfair. And, and, and of course, why would you become a cop today? You know, I mean, you really have to be a dedicated person to want to be in the police force today. But I, you know, these are good people out there. You know, if, you know there are 800,000 policemen in the United States. If 10% of them were bad, that's 80,000. If 1% were bad, that's 8,000. If one-tenth of 1% 1 were bad, that's 800. And with everybody having a camera, you know, all you need is one-tenth of 1% or even half of that. 
uh, to come up with some of these videos that people come up with. But it's uh, it's terrible. They're good people. They want to protect us. That's their job. And uh, and uh, that you know, Black Lives Matter and Antifa are 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 doing everything they possibly can to to bring about what Ian Rand warned about. Uh, we're going to end up with uh, a country that uh, that's a real mess if we. If we don't get this under control, and uh, in November we'll have a choice, we'll see whether yep. we want to go in one direction or another. Well, we're coming out shortly with uh, the next in our Draw My Life series, um, and it's my name is Venezuela. So uh, yeah. you know, if you don't think that it could happen here, um, oh, it could. It, 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 it Talk could. to somebody from Venezuela. They're they're all over the place. You know, yeah. you'll find dentists working in restaurants. I, you know, it's. Uh, Talk to somebody from Venezuela. It, it's, um, it's, it's very interesting. We have, it's incredible that, you know, with our exploding engagement at the Outlet Society, um, the most engaged, biggest audience for us outside of the United States, you'd think it would be like the UK or whatever, it's Venezuela. Even yeah. with the huge exodus of people that have left. So on this video, we have, um, the uh, the voiceover artist is is lives in Venezuela. The um, the artist who did the they, these are women. They all live in Venezuela. So they really, my Spanish teacher lives in Venezuela. So our hearts really go out to the people of Venezuela, and our hearts go out to our country. And not wanting, uh, we need to be an example for the world. And if we can't stand up to socialism on our own soil, then how can we expect others? to uh to resist the, the siren call of, of socialism uh overseas and around the world so um speaking of exodus <laughs> speaking of people uh just leaving saying i'm shrugging i'm not going to do this anymore um that was one of the other questions that the producer at uh cbs uh, on this documentary wanted to was asking me and I thought wow it would have been great for him to be able to ask you because you so the question was about like the demographic changes uh, that happen when socialist policies are implemented that people actually flee so I don't want to put words into your mouth but you know you lived in gorgeous place in Santa Barbara uh, a few years ago about four years ago I guess you moved to uh, Nashville, Tennessee. So tell a little bit about whether or not you think these policies are having this kind of demographic impact and whether or not that played into your own decision a little bit. I think it got to the point where if I saw one more Bernie Sanders bumper sticker, I was gonna go crazy. I mean, it, it, was, it, it, it was so crazy in uh, Santa Barbara, it was so crazy in California. A lot of people think, that I moved the company to Tennessee because it has a zero state income tax rate. And certainly that was a reason to move, but it wasn't the reason to move. It became, we actually were opening restaurants in China and, uh, and in Russia. Uh, we had a big international presence uh, that we grew during the time I was the 16 years I was CEO. And it was actually easier to open a restaurant in Nova Sibirsk, which is in Siberia, or in uh, in um, Singapore, in China, than or Shanghai, uh, than it was to open a restaurant in Los Angeles, and it it got so ridiculous, so absurd. We just couldn't do business there anymore. It made no sense to be there. Uh, the company was founded there by a, a guy named Carl Karcher who bought a hot dog cart in 1941 in South Central Los Angeles, built uh, built uh, the the groundwork for this huge company that. Uh, ended up with restaurants in 45 states and 40 foreign countries by the time I left. And we just, we couldn't keep it in California anymore. The business uh, atmosphere was so negative. It was so demeaning. It was so, you were the enemy. You know, you, you're trying to, you're, we created jobs for 20,000 people in California and it was like we were the bad guys. And uh, so I got my management team together. I said, uh, guys, look, uh, this is when Jerry Brown won for his second term. So it's 2014. I said, look, I, I want to move the company. We're going to move it to Texas or Florida or Tennessee. Uh, my buddy Art Laffer uh, was, was leaning on me to give Tennessee a try. And uh, that's where we ended up. But I said, what do you guys think? You ready to move or you not want to move? And one person in that, on that nine member management team, one person said, well, I don't want to move. 
everybody else was, when do we get out of here? Oh my God. So it was, uh, and I think you're seeing a lot of that. I, I just saw yesterday Ben Shapiro is moving the daily, uh, the daily call or uh, they're moving their whole operation to Nashville. And I will tell you that real estate prices in Nashville are, are zooming. I think that's a positive, although I'm a little nervous about the people moving in. But right. my real estate agent tells me that people are moving from Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Portland, Seattle. They can't find enough housing to take all these people into the Nashville area uh, because they just want to get out of these places where there's no law and order, the free enterprise is attacked, you're overtaxed. It's uh, a beautiful place to live, but a miserable place to be. So uh, so we, we're, I, I think it was a very, one of the best decisions I ever made was to move to Nashville. Everybody keeps calling me now the canary in the coal mine. Yeah, uh, we'll you, sure, you sure were, and I appreciate um, you and Dee letting me into your home, and uh, it was, uh, she, she was so cute, because you, you really had just moved, so there were like boxes everywhere, and she's like, where does this go, where does that go, so that was like, it was a little, be on the fly on the wall. Anytime, you're, all, you're always welcome. The, be the best decision that you ever made, and I, and I, you know, I can't help but think, given the influence that Atlas Shrugged had on you that in which the characters are going on strike and they are at, at some at various points waking up and saying, um, I'm not going to provide the sanction for the victim. So, you know, yeah. I, I recently uh, wrote an article um, called, uh, this was when I was up in San Francisco, um, uh, staying with my parents and it, it was vagrants in our driveway, a teachable moment. And I said, well, you know, uh, if you think that it's really these successful businesses that are really uh, the villains that have caused homelessness, right? That have, it's a housing thing and they've dr driven up the prices and that's why you have drug addicts on the street. Then rejoice everyone because you're about to see what happens when they leave. So, yeah. um, <laughs> all right. So we got some my, awesome. My, uh, your, your it would be uh, my good buddy Peter Kopsis, who also did one of these, actually left Los Angeles this year and went to Colorado in a very, very Atlas Shrug type move. I know, I know. And of course, Colorado, uh, not too far from the location of Galt's Gulch uh, itself. And um, I, can't, I can't wait to see Peter actually. He's coming. He's supporting the Atlas Society's gala like you would not believe um and it's going to be a really great event and i'm sorry i'm not going to be able to event. give you your tito's dirty martini there but thank you for uh making it possible for us to bring some more students so um okay roger hoffman has an interesting okay. yeah question here he says um for you know in your in your book uh the capitalist comeback why use the word capitalism I have some thoughts on this too, because I'm very pro using the word capitalism. But he says, why use the word capitalism, not free enterprise? Marx coined the term capitalism. Capitalism can include crony capitalism, even state capitalism. Fair point. So what, what would you say, Andy? Was it, was it alliteration? I don't want to run away from it. I, uh, I think if we... You know, it, it was, uh, I just said, well, actually, we came up with the name, obviously, well after I wrote the book, and I use uh, capitalism, uh, I use capitalism instead. Of, I, I do use free enterprise as well, but look, if you, you, you switch it, they'll make, yeah, they'll, they'll take free enterprise and make that something awful. There, you know, it used to be that conservatives like you and me were called liberals, uh, but liberals like the name, so around the time of Franklin Roosevelt, uh, now we're classical liberals, and uh, which is a conservative. And uh, I, I just, I don't want to run away from it. I think capitalism is defensible. It's the greatest economic system ever developed. It's the only system where you succeed by meeting the needs of other people. That's even in, even in, in, uh, in Rand's books, although she always talks about your obligation is to yourself, the way people succeed in those books is by meeting other people's needs. And that's a system that pulls that, that, pulls that desire out of us and, um, and really turns it into very, very prosperous and dynamic economies. We've never seen anything like we've seen in the last 200 years. It's all due to capitalism and, uh, and the hell with them. Let's call it capitalism and move on. Yeah, I, I, one of the reasons I actually, um, uh, obviously capitalism and um, using the symbol of the dollar 
in talking about the integrity of money uh, and that money is not, the desire of money is not the root of all evil, but uh, that money is a tool that can take you where you want to go. It's just not the driver. It's not going to take you there. But I, I think that um, in talking about capitalism, one of the things that we are able to discuss is that it's not just, you know, bartering and it's not just, you know, freedom and free markets. It is people that are able to amass a surplus of capital and invest it in other businesses. So I, you know, I think that is something that can get lost. You don't have, you're not going to have investment. You know, you're not going to have uh, capital formation and capital, capital investment. You know, good luck um, having a a free market with without capital. So, um, all right. So let's see. Um, then also have and Roger says thank you for uh, answering my question. Your most my pleasure. Welcome. Um, okay. Uh, I see somebody's asking about another organization which we are not going to talk about. So, uh, but we at the Atlas Society do our thing, and that includes not taking bailout money. Mm hmm Yeah. <laughs> that includes just winning it, winning it, winning it, winning it every day. Uh, okay, Vlad, David, David, you're, sorry, I'm probably butchering your name. Uh, what is your perspective on American companies, uh, on what American companies need to do to develop the workforce to meet the needs um, currently experiencing shortages. Do you support more corporate engagement with the education uh, system to implement more vocational skills-based um, training? That's actually a really good good question. Yeah, there, there, um, when I was nominated for Secretary of Labor, it's one of the issues that I had a number of discussions with people in the administration on. And you've got the federal government spend something like $30 billion a year on jobs trainings and job training programs. Um, the, um, uh, the, the business sector spends about $300 billion. So what we really need to do is try and find a way that the government can work with private businesses. And the, and the Trump administration has been trying to do this. I think uh, Secretary Scalia uh, has been doing a very good job since he took over in this respect. But we need to make sure that people have the opportunities they need. And, and involving, involving the business community is critical because the government doesn't really know what private sector businesses need. Private sector businesses know what they need. So if we, when we get them involved in the training process and we get them involved in uh, doing things like internships and apprenticeships, then we really find that uh, the, the programs become much more productive. I think our education system is a disaster. It no longer prepares anybody for anything other than taking uh, leftist uh, political positions, unless you go to law school or medical school or, or one of the professions. Uh, in undergraduate school, you're not learning a whole lot. Uh, so I, I think we do need to involve uh, the private sector in, um, in jobs training. And the government could be a facilitator of that. Uh, I think anytime the government gets involved in being anything other than a facilitator, it usually screws it up. But I think the uh, the government could help facilitate that process. Amen to that. So, um, okay, Mark Goodkin has a question. He says, if Trump wins, do you expect that riots and protests will intensify along with acceleration of violence against people? Um, he says he's worried that a lot of um, metro areas and states will allow this sort of activity in uh retaliation if trump wins well I, you know i don't i don't want to make a prediction on this i i actually have not talked to the president about this or anybody in the administration but i will tell you that prior to the election the president's uh, ab uh ability to deal with these issues in the cities is um, restricted by political considerations. You know, we don't want to do something that uh, is going to be severely criticized in the press and everything he does is severely criticized in the press. After the election, I think there will be less of a restraint on uh, his using uh, the powers of his office to bring peace to these cities. And look, somebody should bring peace to these cities, whether, uh, whether Trump's elected or Biden's elected, uh, you know, the South Side of Chicago is going to be a war zone. Uh, and somebody needs to go in and fix that. And if the mayor is unwilling to do it and the governor is unwilling to do it, 
somebody needs to protect the American people. And I, uh, I feel very confident that uh, President Trump um, has the power to, to do what needs to be done. And uh, if there was a rioting after the election, uh, I think he would have political support and he would be in a very strong position to deal with that rioting. Okay, they yeah. better not try rioting. Shouldn't try rioting in the south side of Nashville. because <laughs> Those people are all armed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Including and I, me. I, I, bought, uh, I bought guns uh, over the, about two months ago for the first time in my life. I, I, my wife had a gun, had a couple guns, but I was always opposed to it. Now, uh, now I'm a proud gun owner. So I think, uh, I, I think there could be, uh, once the election's over, there could be civil disturbances, but I think the government will be far better able to deal with them. And hopefully, hopefully the Democrats would become supportive at that point, uh, realizing that their far leftist views caused them to lose the election. And um, you know, when, when, when Kenosha caught fire, when the riots happened in Kenosha, that was different. That was different than it happening in LA or San Francisco or Chicago or New York. When it happened in Kenosha, people said, hey, if it, you know, people in the suburbs saying, look, if it happened in Kenosha, which has 100,000 people, it could happen in my town. It could happen in my city. It could happen in my neighborhood. So I think you're going to find more political support for uh, the police uh, and the federal government taking action after the election. But that's just me. I'm not committing anybody to it. That's just my assumption. Uh, what do you think should be some of the priorities for the next administration? I um, mean, should be, regardless of, of who wins, what, what should be first on, on tap? Well, I think creating private sector jobs should be the number one goal because that's what creates the competition for employees, that creates opportunity for employees, that creates increased wages as businesses cre uh, compete for employees rather than employees competing for jobs. And where you see more people joining the labor force and uh, a lot more uh, personal satisfaction across uh, across the country. And I, it, the discouraging thing is that, it, it, and this this is this is an important point that doesn't get made enough in the media or at all, and, unless I'm getting interviewed. But Joe Biden doesn't have one policy, not one policy, where he says, you know, this is what I'm going to do to create private sector jobs. Every policy he has is to grow the government, whether it's the Green New Deal or, you know, whatever, with supporting unions, whatever he wants to do, it's all about spend, expanding the government, spending more money. Nothing says, here's how we're going to encourage entrepreneurs. How we're, here's how we're going to encourage businesses. Here, here's how we're going to light up those animal spirits of the American people that have created the greatest economy in the history of the world. None of that. None of that. So I think... Whoever's elected, I'd like to see him deal with the economy, but I, I, I don't think they are. Second, we need to do something on health care. And uh, they, look, I, I was uh, speaking at Davidson College um, about a year ago, and I, I got a very liberal student saying, you know, Mr. Puster, how can you stand up there? People don't have health care. They're dying in the streets. This is terrible. It's I, I said, look, you know, how can you not support Medicare for all or universal health care? And I said, look, number one, people aren't dying in the streets. You, everybody can go to the emergency room and get care. This isn't Calcutta where there, there aren't people dying in the streets. I said, but, but how about this? How about let's look at what you and I can agree on. I'll bet we both could agree that we need to improve the quality of health care and we want to decrease the price. Would you agree with me on that? And, and this young man said, yeah, I, I, I would agree with you on that. I said, well, then what we need is the one thing in the history of the world that has ever increased quality and decreased price. And that's competition. So when you eliminate competition, which is what happens when you insert the government in a process, you no longer have that, that internal drive to increase quality and decrease price. You only get that with competition. So why would you wanna take the one thing that will increase price and decrease quality and eliminate the one thing that would increase quality and decrease, de decrease price? And he just stood there staring at me. You know, I mean, they don't, I mean, kids, they don't get any of this in school anymore. Even the most simplistic ideas uh, that, that would benefit society as a whole. But I think we need to do something with the healthcare system. I think it should be more like what they're doing in Singapore, where there actually is a competition infused in the system and individual responsibility. 
Um, and we need to do something about law and order. What's happening to the police force in this country is terrible. 80, according to Gallup, 81% of African Americans, 81% of Blacks, and 83% of Hispanics want either the same or a greater police presence in, presence in their neighborhood than they have now. I mean, so this is like 20% of those ethnic groups who are out there you know, protesting and rioting and, and trying to get uh, their communities made less safe, uh, uh, safer for criminals, less safe for everybody else. That's not, that's not what Americans want. Uh, it's not what Americans of any race uh, or creed want, and um, and we need to get focused on law and order. That's great. That's right. As Ayn Rand said, there are three legitimate um, roles for the government. Uh, we need police to protect citizens against criminals. We need defense to defend the country against outdoor, um, outside threats, and we need the courts and to punish criminals and also to adjudicate. Uh, contracts and uphold uh, property rights. So, um, wow, this is just completely flown by, um, Andy, talking to you. I, I could talk to you forever, but I think we have time for a couple of other questions. Oh, hey, it's Larry Borland. Hey, Larry, thank you for your support of the Owl Society, by the way. So Larry says, as a school board president of a medium-sized public school, the board um, and administration shifted the discourse from everyone needs to go to college to we need to match careers with each student. Um, so I'm not sure if that was uh, a question, but he says it was a positive. Well, a question or not, it's a, it's a great idea yeah. and a great approach. Yeah. Uh, I would, I'd encourage that. Uh, well done. Great. Um, so uh, Vicki says, what are the chance that in the near future as higher education is finally being exposed, businesses will be willing to hire people without a college degree? Uh, you know, they're willing to do that now. I, you know, particularly, not, it, it, there are e even private equity firms, uh, it, the investment banking firms in, uh, in New York prior to the pandemic were uh, not encouraging people to get MBAs or go to law school. They were taking people right out of undergraduate school um, and they'd rather train them internally than have them get an MBA or go to law school. And I think you're going to find a lot of businesses are going to be looking towards uh, individuals um, or qualifications uh, apart from college. Because you, look, you know, we're not learning any. They're not learning anything in college other than how to be a, a you know a leftist communist socialist. So I think you'll probably see more of that coming up. Uh, some positions you need an education, uh, and there are some good schools out there. Hillsdale College is a good school. Um, there, there are schools out there where you can get an education. I hope, uh, I hope uh, businesses focus more on them and less on these institutions of uh, socialists and communists like Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Uh, the, the, uh, the formerly great schools have become not so great. Yeah, I told my, uh, I, I went to Harvard and I had somebody um, calling to raise money from me and I uh, wanted to get on a call and talk about it. And I, I sympathize because obviously I do a lot of fundraising for the Atlas Society, but I didn't want to waste her time. And so I told her that I would not only not be donating to Harvard, I was actively recruiting my fellow classmates to make a stand and say that they would not be uh, continuing to, to fund what, um, you know, the nonsense, which is, is not only creating uh, just totally historically illiterate um, citizens, but, uh, but is a disgrace on, on what, you know, used to be a really great um, institution. So, uh, so Bob Haynes, um, and maybe we'll end with this question, it's really about optimism versus uh, pessimism. In a way, he, he thinks, uh, do, is it too late? to save the Republic, given the state of young uh, adults in education? You know, I, I don't think it is. I think, uh, I think if we reelect President Trump, we'll have eight years of, uh, of free market policies. And uh, once the pandemic passes, people will be able to see the benefits. It'll be much like after the Reagan administration. You know, we're, we're seeing the same kind of incredible gains under President Trump that we saw under President Reagan, not only economically, but on the foreign policy front. I mean, 
Who thought the Soviet Union would collapse? Who thought we could bring peace to the Middle East? I mean, you're seeing what happens when you stand by your values and when you, you pursue a rational and, um, and conservative principle. So I think, you know, by, and you got to remember that somebody who was 12 years old when Donald Trump was, was elected will be 20 years old uh, after, after eight years in office. And you'll, you'll have a generation of people that have a better understanding of, uh, of what makes the economy work and how we can improve our country's position in the world. Look, it took them from, uh, I guess from uh, when, when 1992, even, even Bill Clinton, right? Bill Clinton gets elected. He's this liberal Democrat. And even after a few years in office, the influence of President Reagan had been so strong that he had to say in a State of the Union address, the era of big government is over. You know, he, his health care bill lost. He was trying to, he did manage to increase income taxes somewhat and then had to admit he increased them too much. He cut capital gains tax. He actually became an economic conservative by the time he left office. Then you had President Bush, and it took him until 2008 to again elect somebody with these, uh, these far leftist ideas. And even, even uh, President Obama, when he was elected, wasn't elected with, I, he was elected as a centrist. He just didn't happen to be one. Uh, you know, he was a, a centrist, uh, in, he was a, a, a far lefty in, uh, in centrist uh, clothing. And uh, so it, I think we can educate people uh, with reality. But look, we, we're going to have to do something with the education system. Betsy DeVos is trying. President Trump is supportive. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to make some progress in that area as well. But no, it's not too late. Uh, but, you know, I, I think if Hillary Clinton had won, it would have been too late. I think if Joe Biden wins, it may well be too late. So we're going to have to wait and see what happens. Yes, Bob, your question really um, resonates with me as well, because I do, I, I don't mean not to be like Pollyannish, and I'm, I'm not. I don't have to do this, you know. So um, I, I do, I would not be doing what I am doing if I did not believe that it, there is a still a possibility of saving the Republic. Um, I'm also very closely working with uh, the students that are part of our Atlas advocates and Atlas intellectuals um, that are in our book club. And they gave me a, just a tremendous amount of hope. Um, I also uh, say that any, any battle, the only time that any battle is ever truly lost uh, without any hope of reprieve or turnaround is when you believe it's lost. So um, I, I, I wouldn't be doing this. Andy, who's uh, been tireless, tirelessly um, publishing books and writing articles and going on uh, television to make the case. I mean, why does he need to do this? But that he's doing it because he loves the country. And we believe that, uh, that there can be brighter days ahead, but it is not just an automatic given. It takes a lot of hard work. That's what we're doing at the Atlas Society, not just for America, but for all of the people that uh, want to have the right to pursue their happiness, to live their lives, uh, to thrive around the world. That's what we're doing. And we really appreciate all of the support of people like Andy, all of the people who ask great questions uh, that make it possible. So appreciate it. Thank you, Andy. It was great you know, maybe you. Jennifer, we could Leave, maybe we can leave them with the words of Edwin Burke, which are that all, is necess all that's necessary for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. And uh, so hopefully the people on this call, I think, are, are, are not in the group of men that are men or women who will do nothing. Uh, I think we need to prevail against evil. We all need to act. And uh, we should be very aggressive in that respect because this, this is a scary time. Agreed. And, you know, for all of you, some of you who are joining us, you're not in the position necessarily yourself to fight yourself to advance these ideas. If, if, if you aren't, then help, help to advance those who are doing that. that's what the Atlas Society is, is doing for you. So um, you're supporting us helps us to support you. Really appreciate it. Andy, it's great to see you. Say hi to Dee. My pleasure. Yeah. I will. Okay. Same here. We'll see you Thank soon. Thank you. See you on the East Coast. Okay. All right, Bye. Jennifer. Take care. Thanks, everyone.